I'm Dr. Ian McCullough of Johns Hopkins University. This is a short lecture on fake news and rumor correction. Objectives of this lecture are to operationally define some terms associated with fake news. We should understand how people respond in the presence of fake news and why many of the solutions we seek are counterintuitive. We also intend to identify key principles for countering propaganda. To begin, I think it's important for us to provide some operational definitions of some concepts. Fake news is so widely used in the media, uh, we don't really understand what it means. So let's use these terms instead. Misinformation I'm going to define as false information that exists in the environment. Misperceptions are false beliefs. So these are things that people may believe to be true that we know are not. For example, you know, vaccinations cause autism. Uh, or uh, you know, other similar uh, beliefs. Uh, deception is an intentional effort uh, that is intended to cause others to develop misperceptions. Propaganda is not the same as deception. It is information that is presented in a biased way to intentionally affect the beliefs of others. So the information that propaganda is made up with uh, could either be true information or false information, uh, but it is intended uh, to be to affect the beliefs of others by presenting that information, true or otherwise, in a biased way. An attitude is an affinity towards some stimuli that affects the neural processing of information. So the attitude may affect how people are going to interpret, perceive, or uh, understand the information they see. So let's begin to explore a few topics. Uh, first of all, I, I will begin with a few statements. Uh, so Emily Thorson uh, at uh, Syracuse has done some interesting work in this, and she will state that not all exposure to misinformation causes misperceptions. So some people can hear misinformation, uh, but they don't believe it. Not all misperceptions are caused by misinformation. She also makes the argument that there can be facts that people hear uh, that cause them to form misperceptions. And people can correct misinformation and misperception, but still maintain negative attitudes towards future information. So she makes a compelling argument that um, if, if people uh, hear some uh, misinformation or form a misperception, and then they have that corrected by either further evidence, through discussions, through uh, whatever means, they can uh, maintain a negative attitude so that future information they receive uh, might be adversely affected as far as their information processing in the future. So let's explore these concepts a little bit more. Uh, the first concept that Emily brings up is the concept of a belief echo. So she would argue that exposure to misinformation can cause changes in an attitude and that that change in attitude can persist even after people don't believe the misinformation anymore. And I'm going to give you an example of what she means. Let's say a celebrity is accused of some heinous crime. I don't want to specifically name the crime because then that will invoke uh, certain attitudes in uh, you as the listener. But let's just say a, a celebrity on your favorite football team is accused of doing something horrible. So they go to court and the celebrity is uh, found not guilty through some due process that was going on. Regardless of the due process, many people will still have animosity or dislike towards that celebrity, even if they believe he didn't do the crime that he was accused of. Now, the next time uh, they hear information, they're going to be much more likely to be believe or process negative information about that celebrity than positive information. And again, the, the facts in this uh, situation are largely irrelevant. Uh, what matters is the cognitive processing of the information that people have. So even though they receive some misinformation, they have that misinformation corrected, so they don't have the misperception anymore, uh, they can have this belief echo remain that makes them more likely to believe negative information in the future. So many people would advocate for a strategy of inoculation. And inoculation kind of works like this. You're going to bolster some positive message by stating the positive message. You'll give a few weak counter arguments, explain why those counter arguments are wrong, and then echo the positive message again. Here's the problem with that. Stating any counter argument may create a belief echo. 
So when you when you state these weak counterarguments, you may be actually invoking some sort of belief echo that then affects future messaging that you wish to do. And so it is advised that if you really want to inoculate, you need to inoculate against the source, not against the message itself. Let me give you an example. So let's say the misinformation is that sugary soda boosts the immune system. Okay, we know that that's not true. That's why I'm using it. So counter message one, this is one option you may use. Uh, you may state, you may hear that sugary soda boosts the immune system. This is not true, and research shows there is no evidence for this. Soda is bad for you. Now, the problem with this is that in your first statement, where you say you may hear that sugary soda boosts the immune system, you may have just inadvertently created a belief echo because you've stated the weak counterargument. If I use uh, counter message number two, you might hear the sugar lobby try to spread misinformation about sugar. They just want to make money and will mislead you. Sugary soda is bad for you. In this example, we have not stated the misinformation, so we're less likely to have created a belief echo. Instead, we are offensively attacking the source. We're naming a sugar lobby. We're giving uh, motivation, creating our own uh, propaganda, if you will, uh, that they want to make money, that this is a motivation for why they would lie, and then we are, are creating doubt in the veracity of that information. So let's turn to the other idea here that uh, Emily brings up, which is that misperceptions can be fact-based. So she uses this example that says 68% of Americans believe that China owns more than half the U.S. debt. Now, many Americans in, in uh, her research think that if the U.S. doesn't pay its debt, that China can repossess parts of the U.S., now, if we correct this mis uh, misperception, because that's not really true, China's not going to come and, and take over the uh, United States because we owe them money, but correcting the misperception may lead to poor voter decision-making where they say, well, it's not necessary to have uh, fiscal responsibility or balance the budget, and they don't necessarily understand the economic implications of such decisions. So in those cases, sometimes the government doesn't wish to correct misperceptions, um, and it's not based on misinformation, it's actually based on facts. So let's turn our attention now to misinformation correction. Let's say you do want to correct uh, misinformation. Well, here's some things that uh, people in the U.S. Uh, believe in large numbers. Uh, President Obama was not born in the U.S. The Affordable Care Act requires elderly people to meet with government officials to discuss end-of-life care and euthanasia. The U.S. government assisted in 9-11 to justify war in the Middle East. And just so you don't think I'm politically biased, I'll throw another one in there. Uh, Donald Trump was colluding with the Russians to win the U.S. presidential elections. So these are all items, you know, and, and depending upon your, your current political view, you may agree or disagree with some of them. But let's look at a couple of them. Uh, President Obama is, uh, was born in the U.S. So the question is, how many people believe that President Obama was born in the U.S.? Well, I'll draw your attention uh, over here to uh, April of 2011. Uh, before the release of Obama's actual birth certificate, 55% of Americans thought that he was born in the U.S., 15% thought he was not, and 30% were unsure. And I'm showing what Republicans believed, uh, you know, self-reported Republicans believed at the same time. So you can see that fewer believed that Obama was born in the U.S., more believed that this was uh, false, uh, that, he was, that he was not born in the U.S., and also more were unsure. So after they actually release the birth certificate, you'll see an increase in people that believe that uh, Obama was in fact born in the U.S. and a decrease in those that thought he wasn't. And, and a lot of the unsure people uh, joined the people that thought, okay, he's actually born in the U.S. But look at what happens six months later. We actually see um, you know, a, a fading of this belief where uh, the, the number of people that believe that Obama was actually born in the U.S. starts declining, and, and by a year later, uh, the same levels. But look what happens here to the people that believe it's false. It actually increases. So now, after Obama's birth certificate was released to the public, more people believe that he was not born in the U.S. than before that, that misinformation was corrected. And you see that that's an even stronger result among uh, Republicans.
So Adam Berinsky did some additional work in this area, and, uh, and he then designed a, uh, an interesting experiment where he looked at this uh, misinformation about the uh, Affordable Care Act requiring uh, euthanasia. So he basically took some misinformation right, that was published, and we'll highlight this. So this is a health care reform issue. Will there be death panels? And uh, basically the argument here is that uh, it, the government's going to make it mandatory that people on Medicare have required counseling sessions. They're going to tell them how to end their life sooner. And that if you um, have every right to fear, you should not have the government-run plan decide when to pull the plug on grandma, right? So what he did is he he provided a case where there's a control where people get to read the full context of the discussion and then the misinformation is where this is selectively uh, you know information from the same full context but it's selectively taken and uh, shown to people and then in some of the trials here then he, he corrects that misinformation by showing them the other view here so on this side you know healthcare reform and death panel setting the record straight so the American Medical Association and the National Hospice on Palliative Care uh, organizations support the provision and John Rother, executive vice president for AARP, the seniors lobby repeatedly has declared the death panel rumors are false. So this is kind of setting the, the record straight. And so he also had some other um, uh, variations where he said, well, what if a Democrat corrects the uh, uh, misinformation or what if a Republican corrects the misinformation? And so his findings are interesting. Uh, in the control, you can see immediately after reading the full context, you know, how many people believe in this information? We're going to focus on the red line here that, you know, um, that, you know, most people here are, are going to believe that, you know, the information is false. And then when they hear the rumor only, right, fewer, um, you know, fewer people are going to have that correct opinion. And then when they get it corrected, it kind of returns to the control value. And if a Republican corrects it, um, it's even stronger because it doesn't uh, advantage the Republicans to correct this rumor. And uh, if the Democrats do, it, it's still stronger than just the plain rumor, but uh, rumor correction, but not as strong as the Republican. Look what happens two weeks later. Two weeks later, we return to almost the exact same levels as we did before, and we see that the, uh, the, the correction of misinformation uh, does not have a very long-lasting effect. So what do we learn from this? First of all, misinformation is sticky. Once people hear misinformation or they're exposed to it, uh, it's very, very difficult to correct that in any kind of long-term way. Uh, any kind of fact-based correction tends to fade over time. Uh, and in some cases, as we've, we've learned in, the, uh, in, in uh, this research, the fact-based correction can actually create a boomerang effect in certain populations and make them more predisposed to believe the misinformation than before they ever heard the correction. We also find that source credibility is very significant in this correction, uh, which then further uh, you know, supports this idea of attacking the source as opposed to sticking with a fact-based uh, misinformation correction. We also need to point out the belief echoes can easily be created with careless correction attempts. So why? Let's look at a model for influence, and, and this is uh, my model uh, that is an integration of several different common uh, models in uh, influence and persuasion. Uh, I'm going to draw your attention to the upper left corner here. So the first thing when a piece of information is delivered to a subject or a person, um, are they aware of the message? And if not, do they care about the message? And if the answer is still no, then, you know, you probably have what we call system one thinking. It's, it's very peripheral. It's, it's not really something that people think about too much. There might be some priming effect, but uh, people haven't really attended the information or thought much about it. Okay, well, let's change that a little bit. Let's say they've never heard the message, but you have managed to make them care about it. And so now their system two thinking might uh, kick in. This is the logical processing of the brain. And so now at this point, Rhetorical persuasion, what you learn in uh, English composition, uh, becomes important, right? Ethos, pathos, logos uh, are going to be effective at helping form an opinion. People are going to think about the information because you've made them interested. They're going to look at the information that, that you've uh, told them. They're going to make some sort of uh, decision on what they believe. 
So now the next time they receive information, they've heard about it before. So now you, you don't, no longer use this part of the flowchart. They, they now ask the next question, which is, is this information I've just received consistent with my existing opinion? And if the answer is yes, then maybe you haven't made them think too much, and it's just going to reinforce that opinion. Here's where it gets interesting. Let's say the information they're receiving is uh, contrary to what they already believe. Uh, what ends up happening uh, for the brain to kind of make coherence in, in its worldview and, and what it understands is going to start a process called counterarguing. So this is where the logical resources of the brain are not engaged to ascertain the veracity of the information that they're receiving. It's uh, engaged to come up with logical reasons why they should disbelieve this inconsistent information. So the question is, well, what happens if that counter-arguing is not disrupted? Well, system two gets very active and people actually get good at counter-arguing and become polarized away from the message. So this is where if you tell a Republican that has believed that Obama is not born in the U.S. and you show him the birth certificate, okay, initially he might be more likely to believe that, okay, well, maybe Obama was born in the U.S., but over time, as his brain gets more practiced at coming up with reasons why he shouldn't believe that, oh, well, that's not the real birth certificate. That's a, that's a summarized birth certificate. Uh, or they come up with other reasons why they shouldn't believe the information they saw. And then they become more convinced that Obama was not born in the U.S. than they were before. And so that's what the counter-arguing does. If, however, you're successful in disrupting counter-arguing, then you can actually get to some sort of longer-term behavior change. And so where we need to focus on in influence operations is on counter-arguing and how to effectively breach or disrupt that. Before we get there, though, we have four key uh, target audience analysis questions that we must understand. We must understand what the audience knows about an issue, what their current opinion is on the issue, what makes them care, and then think about options to disrupt counter-arguing. So let's talk a little bit about social proof. Uh, I know I'm switching directions here uh, a little bit. But social proof is where people assume the actions of others in an attempt to reflect correct behavior. This is where social psychology kicks in. So there's a couple things that we have to understand about that before we can say, hey, the general society has these views and people are going to respond to it. Well, that's not exactly true. People are going to use interest as a filter, and they're going to tend to prefer information that reinforces these existing beliefs. So right there, people aren't looking at the information in the society writ large. They're going to select people to trust and believe based on this fact of, hey, are their views similar to mine? Uh, are they telling me consistent, coherent information? Social networks, however, matter and affect this influence because while people might be more likely to engage in trusted relationships with people that agree with them, um, there's other ties that go into social networks that can make this a little bit more complex and a little more interesting. We certainly don't have time to go into all of this here, but I'm going to touch on a little bit of it. So interest is a filter. Uh, so people have talked about echo chambers. So um, some interesting facts here that uh, if we look at uh, Silverman and others' uh, research, uh, he identifies several different news stories that he classifies as fake news or misinformation and says, well, how many people have heard this? And so in his studies of approximately, uh, you know, close to 2,000 respondents, he finds that, you know, a lot of people haven't heard the information, that it's actually a fairly small percentage of the people that have actually uh, heard the misinformation. And so, you know, one of these items like FBI agent suspected in Hillary email leaks found dead in apparent murder suicide. So that is going to be a certain type of people that are going to be likely to hear that information, uh, that are going to likely, uh, you know, come across it. But what he finds is those people that actually hear that information at much larger percentages are more likely to believe it. And this is supporting this idea that if you have an interest in a certain attitude or belief, you're going to be more likely to seek out or be exposed to information that supports those views because of your social network, and then you're going to be more likely to believe it. Uh, Alcott and uh, uh, Genskow uh, look at, at some of these different sites and they say, you know, here's a typical information diet of where people consume media for top news sites. And what they've classified as fake news sites, they see uh, a much higher uh, reliance on social media for those uh, uh, pieces of information. And 
And so then yet an, another group has uh, done some work where they map out the typical information diet. And so we have, you know, conservative red, uh, liberal blue, and, and moderates uh, gray. And we would say this is a typical information diet where news information has been scored on some scale ranging from highly conservative to highly liberal. And this would be a normal information diet for a typical uh, person. However, when we look at uh, fake news consumptions and reliance, we'll see that there are these bimodal jumps where there is a you know, large number of people that are highly conservative that are going to be um, relying on this with much greater frequency, much greater volume. So what we're seeing is that fake news is more likely to be viewed and believed with those that have a very skewed information diet, but that that polarization comes first. It's once you have a highly liberal or highly conservative view, that is going to uh, cause you to seek out and trust certain information with greater likelihood, and then that can perhaps reinforce and magnify those views. So another key area, uh, key property here, or principle in social networks is the majority illusion effect. And so what the majority illusion effect is saying is, if we take two networks, and, and I'm going to show you an example here of one uh, on the left, A, and one on the right, B, both of these networks have exactly the same structure. And the red nodes indicate uh, people that have a minority view. So this might be what we would consider fake news, right? Or, um, you know, maybe it's not fake. Maybe it's real news. It's just a piece of information that most people don't believe. And so you don't have the ability to survey the entire network to know what everybody believes on a certain issue because most of us just don't have access to that data and and if we were to try and get it it would be expensive so we survey the people in our local neighborhood so you know for one of these nodes right uh, like this guy here has two neighbors they both happen to be red nodes and when we look at the network on the left and we survey all of the nodes and we say what proportion of their neighbors believe in the red view we find that on the network in the left, most people uh, think that most of their friends, 50% or more, believe in this minority view that only in reality three people share. If we look at the network on the right, same structure, same number of people believe this minority view, most people would agree that uh, that's not what people believe. In fact, there's only two people that think that even half their friends believe the, uh, the minority view. And so that property where uh, people believe that a minority view is held by most people in the network. That is called a majority illusion. The reason why that's interesting from an influence effect or influence perspective is that it's a social network property that we can measure. We can measure it by two uh, variables, uh, exposure and assortativity, which I'll explain more in a minute. But when this has occurred through social networks moderating how people receive information like through social media or the internet, uh, it can create uh, conditions for pluralistic ignorance. And pluralistic ignorance is a term that describes the misperception of a social norm. And that misperception of the social norm drives behavior. So the classic example is if you ask a college student how many beers they drink at a party, they'll typically say three to five. If you ask them how many their friends drink, they'll say, oh, you know, six to ten. So there's this view that all of their friends are drinking twice as much as them, doing twice as much drugs, and oh, by the way, having twice as much promiscuous sex. So that misperception of the norm causes college students to drink more, engage in more uh, high-risk sexual behavior, and uh, be more likely to do drugs or become addicted to drugs. Once they leave college, they then have this perception that the social norm has changed, and then that moderates their behavior. So I told you there were two key properties. So one is exposure. So what I'm showing you is uh, an adoption curve. So what you see is on the x-axis is time points. So these are, there are points in time when we observe a particular uh, level of adoption. This is uh, some, some new view, attitude, or it could be the latest iPhone. It could be any kind of innovation that somebody's adopted. And then what you're seeing on the y-axis is the percent of people that have adopted. So over time, more and more people adopt, and it typically follows this S-shape where initially a few people try it out, so it takes a while, and then it hits this place where it kind of starts going viral, and, and everybody joins the bandwagon, and then you have a few laggards that take a while to join the, uh, the, the group. So 
In the initial stages, degree, which is the number of connections somebody has, is very important for starting these viral behaviors. So if a, if a node um, has a great deal of followers, then uh, it's more likely that people are going to observe that node or see that node, and uh, then these low threshold adopters might join. But what we find is these high degree nodes tend to have a low ratio of converted followers. So while you know, Taylor Swift has hundreds of millions of followers on Twitter, um, people aren't really looking to Taylor Swift to form their political opinions. Uh, however, Taylor Swift's 1% is much higher than Ian McCullough's 90% or even 100% for that matter. So degree initially in the stages is important because it increases exposure, which can magnify that majority illusion effect. However, later adoption is going to be determined by a different measure called betweenness, which uh, is a measure that describes the ability for nodes to broker uh, information, knowledge, and resources to different areas of the network. And then to get to those laggards, we tend to view closeness, which really requires a short, uh, measures of the shortness of the distance to uh, everybody else in the network. Um, assortativity is this other uh, measure that it contributes to majority illusion. And this is the, uh, the tendency for high degree nodes to either um, connect to other high degree nodes or low degree nodes. And so what we've observed in measuring uh, assortativity in several social media uh, firestorms, these are large negative word of mouth campaigns that occur online. Uh, so uh, uh, Jurgen Pfeffer and uh, Momin Malik collected a bunch of these different data sets that they've shared with us. And uh, so what we found is, um, based on their classifications, they identified some firestorms as kind of these popular starts. So these are things that were started by celebrities or corporations that have um, pre-positioned their access and placement into networks in, in order to magnify their advertising or influence effect. Uh, and they've and so we'll call those popular starts, and those are distinguished from grassroots starts. So these are just regular people that that get offended or upset about something, and then start something, and then it kind of takes off. And so what we notice is the assortativity. This is cumulative assortativity starts out very negative in these uh, in these popular starts, and then very quickly they they increase and they tend to converge at some uh, negative value, right? So we see that in, in a couple of these different firestorms. In grassroots, we see that it doesn't necessarily start off that negative, but it tends to dip down before it, it adopts this same similar pattern. And so what does this tell us? This tells us that uh, assortativity is not only uh, an, a factor in uh, majority illusion, it may be involved in viral spread of these uh, campaigns or information, which could include misinformation as well as uh, truthful information. So we've just discussed a bunch of concepts, and, and i just like to recap. We've talked about belief echoes. So these are um, uh, particular statements, depending on how they are uh, delivered in, in the information environment. Even if they're used to correct misinformation, they can create these echoes that affect the attitudes, and then, of course, later processing of information, so that truthful information uh, may be uh, received negatively, based on the attitudes people have towards the information. Uh, we've seen that uh, correction of misinformation or rumors kind of has some counterintuitive uh, dynamics that goes on there and can actually lead to a boomerang effect if they're not conducted correctly. Uh, we've looked at counter-arguing, which is this principle that when people see information that's inconsistent with what they already believe, or uh, that, that uh, they sometimes somehow have negative affinity towards, it can create uh, logical processing in the brain, uh, not to ascertain the veracity of information, but to uh, come up with justification to disbelieve otherwise true information. We've looked at interest filters, so how people kind of shape uh, their social networks and where they trust and uh, consume uh, information based on their pre-existing beliefs, and how these kind of contribute to this uh, uh, social network effect called majority illusion, which leads to pluralistic ignorance and um, the um, um, how these misperceived social norms can create influence effects in and of themselves. We've also seen how the stages of information diffusion um, are also affected by social network measures. And so 
the kind of key takeaway from that is not only are there belief echoes and and kind of counter arguing creating these these kind of counterintuitive uh, dynamics but social network analysis is also a critical tool to help us sort through and understand these uh, competing uh, theories so the conclusions Fake news must first be operationally defined with some more specific terms in order to understand what's going on in, uh, in these uh, um, dynamics. Influence is much more complex than uh, studying fact versus fiction. So when you hear fictional or misinformation or rumors or whatever you want to call it, simply setting the facts straight uh, really does not achieve influence. and is probably more likely to be counterproductive if you have not properly addressed issues of counterarguing and belief echoes. Therefore, leaders must understand some basics about cognitive influence to make effective decisions on what they choose to do in the information environment. And finally, social networks are critical to influence. So this has been a short lecture. I'm Dr. Ian McCullough at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you for your time.